cancel culture. Cancel culture. Cancel culture. Just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. History has always taught us that once they start destroying symbols, they soon turn on flesh and blood. For every statue the mob tears down, they'll also tear down a person's career and reputation. And for every film or book that gets banned, they will silence a human voice. This insidious practice has a name, cancel culture. In this Sky News special investigation, we will chat to those who have felt the wrath of the mob simply for holding an opinion. Those whose careers have been shattered, whose lives have been turned upside down. And we'll talk to the experts about where this sinister cancel culture came from and how it now threatens even you. Indeed, some of the people who contacted us are so cowed by the thought of being cancelled that they dare not speak up publicly. But we're not only going to look at how far this cancer has spread, we're going to do something about it. We're going to give you the tools to cancel cancel culture. But what exactly is cancel culture? Surely it just means people getting fired for being unprofessional or doing something highly offensive or inappropriate. No, that is not what we are talking about here. Of course, there are plenty of examples of people fairly or unfairly losing their jobs. But cancel culture is far more insidious than that. Cancel culture is when people are silenced and have both their reputation and their livelihood publicly taken away from them simply because they expressed a politically incorrect point of view. In that respect, cancel culture is no different to other totalitarian forms of censorship. You are silenced because you said the wrong thing, and frequently, you simply disappear. You've been cancelled. Well, cancel culture is just a way of um, pushing people out of the public square, right? Different ways to silence them. Uh, different ways to discredit and, and sideline them. And that is why it's so dangerous in our system, Rowan, because our free and open society depends on the public square, everyone having their say, and um, we, in a free society, settle our disputes by public argument in the public square, not by violence. It means denial of freedom of speech, uh, the ability to discuss the issues of grave concern uh, without, without putting your, your life at risk, without putting your livelihood at risk. Uh, it's so detrimental to, uh, to just civil discourse nowadays. Cancel culture is when people have both their reputation and their livelihood destroyed simply because they expressed a politically incorrect point of view. It's when Essentially, your argument is cut off because you're a bad person, so they don't engage in the actual argument. They just make out you're a bad person, and that's the end of the story. You don't have to listen to that person anymore. The issue is not the specific topic. Whether it's climate change, immigration, multiculturalism, same-sex marriage, or any other controversial topic, the actual subject matter is not what the real target is. The sole aim of cancel culture is to so totally traumatise the individual that they never dare open their mouth again. By cancellation, what they tend to mean is the destruction of a person's reputation, the smearing of them with all of the worst accusations of our time, and preferably, in the eyes of the activists, the losing of not just their current job, but any likelihood of further employment in the future. Cancel culture has actually taken us back probably about 80 years, uh, back to the 1930s, uh, where we, you, uh, you not only uh, uh, want to argue with someone about difference of opinion, but you just want to destroy their career and, and destroy their, 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 their entire life. And that. So it's costing people jobs, it's costing businesses money. Uh, it's not just about, uh, you know, we've got a different view, we, we can argue about that different view. It's about, I'm going to destroy you. So what they do is they use posturing and violence to try and force through an argument that has no grounding in any civilised society. It's not justice, it's a lynch mob. It's 
a group of people who do not adhere to the standards of innocent until proven guilty, but want the guilty verdict nonetheless, and are going to go to whatever lengths to achieve it. And there's also no measure of where that punishment ends. So maybe you did something silly, you said something silly. Well, the punishment for that is always going to be death. There's no measure to what your crimes are. So it's just these hordes of people online, not the size of a town square, but millions and millions of people with unlimited power to comment, to contact your bosses, your neighbors, your schools, whatever, and destroy your life. Sadly, cancel culture has a long and sinister history. From the Salem witch trials in the 17th century, book burnings in the 1930s, and the McCarthy Red Scare in the 1950s. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? Well, I think there's always been within the human psyche uh, a desire to push out people um, who challenge orthodoxies. And there are dozens of modern examples. A senior executive forced out of Boeing for something he said 30 years ago. Bettina Arndt being shunned and silenced earlier this year for a tweet. Australian comedian Chris Lilly had his own shows cancelled. What did the priest say when I punched him in the dick? What? what? You're a dickhead! <laughs> You're a comedian. You're going to offend somebody, you know? And we all stop and say, no, we shouldn't, we should, but hang on. Why don't we just say, look, I find it funny. If you don't, well, your hard luck. Chris Lilly, for example, is he's, he's taking on those characters. It's not malicious in my view. Though, if the people who are portrayed in other cultures, the, the, uh, the Tongan culture or whatever, is offended by it, then that's, that's disappointing. Maybe you know, then you have to take that into account. And, but I, I think humour is, is often a bit edgy. And so, no, I'm more than happy to, to let humorists and cartoonists have their say. But intriguingly, there are plenty of those who do have sympathy with the idea of cancel culture. I'm a white privileged woman. Like, if the First Nations people said that they want it gone, it's gone. If black people said that they want it gone, it's gone. Like, it's not for me to decide that. It's for me to back those people up that are making those decisions. Indeed, some of the people we approached to discuss this topic agreed with the importance of it, but simply did not dare speak up publicly for fear of the effect on their families. This is barbaric. You wouldn't be interested in being interviewed about our old mate James Cook over there, would you? No, thanks. OK, mate. We're looking to chat to people about the statue there. Would you be interested in being filmed uh, for sorry, television? Yeah, I you got to run? And in much the same vein, we found many people simply reluctant to talk about even the topic of cancel culture. I'd rather not. You'd no. rather not? <laughs> you sure? Uh, yeah, I won't. I OK. Won't. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Anyone can fall foul of the mob. You, too, can be cancelled, lose your job, be lynched by social media, terrorised, just because you expressed an opinion. That is not compatible with our free, proud, open society where we govern ourselves through, through free public argument. And that argument cannot be constrained or we are no longer a free society. The surprising thing is it's remarkably effective. Um, I set up the Free Speech Union um, back in February uh, to try and protect people from being cancelled merely for dissenting from progressive orthodoxies. Um, and when we first set it up, I got about six calls a week from people who needed our help. Now I'm getting about six calls a day. The number of people in our societies, in countries like Australia and Britain, who are increasingly just persuaded to keep their heads down, to submarine their views. And here's what happens with that. Perfectly reasonable views, indeed views held by the majority of the public, are turned into or portrayed as if they are reprehensible. And here in Australia, we are not immune to it. It is coming at us like a freight train. I think a turning point is happening now for, you know, the quiet Australians who have been quiet for so long, who are now realising, whoa, you know, I've been quiet for too long and look what's happening all around us. And, you know, <laughs> they'll come for you too. So you have to stand up to it. 
cancel culture can hit you out of the blue, and it can be for no logical or factual reason whatsoever. But even when it's a lie, you have no way of fighting back. 2016, when I uh, published a book during the marriage campaign as head of the Australian Marriage Forum, and it was a labour of love, this book, and it turned out to be, in, as Lyle Shelton, the head of our campaign, said, it was the seminal work of the No Case. But uh, the printer for my publisher, Connor Court, at the very last minute, uh, uh, refused to print the book. Actually, refused yeah, literally quarter to midnight the day before the book launch. I was essentially cancelled by the university for saying that uh, a lot of the work on the Great Barrier Reef is not properly checked, tested and replicated and that some of the institutions were untrustworthy. And they didn't want to engage in that argument, so I was fired, essentially. Obviously, last year I had my, uh, my speaking tour and I had people stand at the front at one event and protest when they had no idea whatsoever what I was talking about in my speaking tour. Uh, there's been demands that I shouldn't be allowed to speak about Indigenous issues because I don't toe the line, I don't follow the narrative, I challenge the status quo. It was it was kind of bizarre actually because my wife had sort of warned me that this might happen because uh, of my outspoken view suggesting that men can't change sex and become women. Uh, but I actually thought she was just being paranoid. So when, um, when the police actually did contact me, um, I, I didn't know whether to be shocked, outraged, or just laugh out loud, quite frankly. In the first lockdown in Melbourne, um, we were one of the first businesses to kind of stay open. Well, we stayed open the whole time and we pivoted quite quickly. We got a little bit of media traction. Lucky Penny on Chapel Street was once a bustling all-day brunch spot. Determined to stay afloat, the venue's been transformed. What was Lucky Penny Functions and Cafe is now the Lucky Penny Grocery Store. And then one on Twitter must have hit someone's nerve and he, we got a lot of backlash. Um, and within 24 hours, we had a full anti-Lucky Penny campaign put against us. And then they got all of their followers to um, do negative reviews on our um, Google page and our Facebook page. You see, Cancel culture is no different from other totalitarian forms of censorship. It doesn't matter whether your argument has merit or not, you are cancelled simply because you said the politically wrong thing. And the cost to your livelihood, your family, your social life and your mental health can be devastating. It's very racist. Uh, you see, in fact, the last 20 years, I can say that the, the vast majority, probably the 99.9% .9 of racial abuse that I have received has been through that cancel culture and the left. Uh, because I had, they not only uh, say that, I, you know, your opinions are wrong, that, you know, you're just some, you know, some, uh, and, they, and I won't say it here, there's some horrible terms and I've, re uh, and, they, and they did affect me at one stage, I did have, you know, very serious mental health problems. Uh, problems and in fact uh, last year when I was attacked uh, there's uh, the moment and this is public knowledge that where my wife found me in the backyard laying on the ground in the rain uh, c contemplating about because my backyard goes over a 20 meter drop about throwing myself over that fence. It got to a point in 2016, 2017, where people began to contact my employer, which was Patreon at the time. That's where I was doing my business, having people donate to my YouTube videos. And they had me shut down, locked out of the website. I remember sitting there and having them message me and telling me, because of your politics, you can't be on our site anymore and thinking, how am I gonna pay the bills next month? How am I going to pay? How am I going to live? How am I even going to get out of this country? I was in Italy at the time, because I'm not going to have a paycheck. You know, it's cost me a great deal uh, in terms of my well-being and in terms of my future work prospects. I've had a lot of uh, calls from people within the business to say you need to be quiet now. Um, otherwise, you know, the threats of. Of, of the fact that I might not work again. And also I've had, um, there's been a lot of people, you just have to scroll through my Twitter mentions to find the people adding all of the people I've ever worked for saying, if you ever hire this guy again, we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna support you. Uh, I walk around my community 
knowing now that there are individuals that I've grown up with, some who are even family, who will, will now cross the street um, when they see me coming or simply pretend I don't exist. Spurred by the pent-up frustration of the lockdowns and driven by the Black Lives Matter riots, cancel culture has exploded. The death of George Floyd at the end of May, the explosion of the BLM movement in the wake of that uh, has turbocharged cancel culture and it's now become um, uh, almost uh, a pandemic. People are changing the name of cheeses, of beers, of pubs and of anything else that has even the vaguest connection with our colonial past. Any number of Australian woke corporations happily joining forces with online lynch mobs eagerly seeking approval for their pathetic virtue signalling at the same time as completely ignoring the damage cancel culture is doing. There's any number of examples like colonial beer being hassled, coon cheese ditching its name and much loved lollies like Chico and Redskins being scrapped. What we're seeing is people who want to wipe the entire past clean. They want to start from year zero. They have a vision, a utopian vision of society, and everything in the past stands in their way. People who start to assault all of the representations of the past, we know will start on people next. So many historical examples demonstrate this. We have seen statues around the world torn down, even when, absurdly, some of those statues were of people who devoted their lives and their careers to fighting racism, such as Winston Churchill, who defeated Hitler, and fighting to abolish slavery, such as Hans Heggs, Ulysses S. Grant, and even the African-American Frederick Douglass had his statue torn down. Here in Australia, we have seen attempts to cancel Captain Cook, either by vandalising his statue or, and this is in some ways even worse, denigrating the most significant and historic moment of his life's work, the landing at Botany Bay. They call it Invasion Day and condemn Cook, a man of science and of peace, as some kind of monstrous racist. Yet how can we possibly judge a man 200 years later and who does the judging? I just wanted to ask you about the statue here of James Cook. Do you think that statue should be here or not? Yeah, I'm absolutely fine with it. A lot of people want to tear it down. Would you go along with that? No, no, I, I think uh, statues are historical. They, they um, talk about the time that was and still relevant today, so I'm happy with it here. There are people who want to take the statue down. Do you think that's a good idea? No. No. It's a symbol for the park. It's, it's a symbol. symbol? Yeah. It's a symbol of, uh, of what it meant. You know, this guy's come from the other corner of the world. He didn't come here to, you know, set off some grand invasion. We also recognise that how our history and how this country was founded and why to be proud of that. There are things that we aren't, so I would say I'm not proud of. I wish, you know, history could be re rewritten and correct those errors, but in learning about it, you'll then know not to repeat those again. So you're quite happy if things like that go, if enough people want it gone? You know, personally for me, yes. I'm happy with it being there, but at the same time, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me if it's not there at the same time. As an ally, I've been told that those touches are offensive and people don't appreciate and respect them. They're a sign of oppression and violence and they signal hurt for people. So that, in that regard, like, if they want them down, they should be down. If, like, they don't want them there, they shouldn't be there. Who should decide that? The collective, like a, like a unanimous decision amongst the collective. The collective? That's right. Under the rules of cancel culture, the anonymous mob make the rules and the rest of us have to just put up with it, even if we are innocent of the charge. And in much the same way, and equally as grotesque, is the fact that cancel culture frequently targets and destroys the very people who are trying to help solve complex social problems such as Jacinta Price, the director of Indigenous Research at the CIS, or Warren Mundine, the advisor to two prime ministers on Indigenous affairs. This is the type of stuff that comes at you, and you know, some of the polite stuff is, is sort of like Uncle Tom and, and Coconut and all that stuff, but I could give you other terms that just, just uh, are dreadful terms that you'd never think would be coming from, uh, from people, uh, you know, who should be uh, know better. Indeed, when it comes to cancelling people for the crime of racism, the truth has no meaning at all.
all of the polling in the UK suggests that we are a very tolerant country and we're becoming more tolerant with every passing minute. But what is so sad is that um, we're now being forced into a position of less tolerance as our culture is so universally attacked by this very screamy and very angry little minority of people who haven't been very well educated, bless them. Because I don't think you know, because you're accusing me of all sorts of insane stuff, like I'm a white supremacist and fascist, I can assure you I'm not, but it doesn't seem like these people care. <laughs> the great comedian Ricky Gervais has claimed that comedy is now dead because of cancel culture. And it's got so bad that a group of prominent thinkers like J.K. Rowling and Salman Rushdie wrote a letter complaining about cancel culture. But in the ultimate irony, those who signed that letter immediately found themselves being cancelled. Actually, the, the, the people this really affects are the people who aren't cancelled. It's the, it's the people who are, who are seeing what happens to other people and whose behaviour is affected by that. And that's an enormous quantity of people who are working in intellectual fields in this country. Uh, and so I, I, I hope people understand that this is, it's not this pick a -un intellectual issue. It's actually pretty significant cultural phenomenon. We are hurtling towards an Orwellian nightmare where words and ideas are banned, history is obliterated, and people simply refuse to discuss tricky matters. Is this what we really want? It's called cancel culture, so you cancel people. Do you think that's a good idea? No, that's not. Why not? Yeah, that's an entity that symbolizes an identity of Australia. And uh, I don't know, like, why these people are doing that. No, I think it's a stupid, like, idiotic movement that feeds hatred and negativity. And, like, it's from this weird, like, discourse of, like, self-hatred and, like, I don't know, it's just a, it's a horrible thing. I hate it. I think uh, people should have their opinions. Um, I think that's why I think it's okay to also call it out. The silent majority maybe have got to speak out. Got to speak you know, out? You've, you've got to speak out. How do we reverse this sinister revolution? How do we stop this rapid slide into censorship and totalitarianism? Fortunately, there are already organisations like Toby Young's Free Speech Union and Harry Miller's Fair Cop, both of which you will find online. But ultimately, it is up to every one of us to stand up for free speech and to fight back against the sinister lynch mob. Those who have lived through cancel culture who felt its devastating impact firsthand have provided four surefire steps. One, arm yourself with facts and with the truth. Truth, you arm yourself with facts, you arm yourself with evidence, uh, and you have to, you have to ignore, when, when you're engaged um, in you know, conversation or, or online dialogue with individuals who just want to tear you down, you have to just, you have to be strong and stick to the facts and the truth. That, the facts and the truth cannot be denied. Two, stand up for your mates. And even when you don't agree with their opinion, as Voltaire said, defend their right to speak their mind. That is real Aussie mateship. We've got to uh, support and give a voice to uh, uh, to people out there who live, are living in fear. And this is the worst thing that could happen because when people live in fear, you don't know what that breaking point's going to be and what the result of that breaking point is. And so we need to be able to, uh, to challenge them. Three, call out the bullies in the workplace at social gatherings. Encourage friendly debate and agree to disagree with family, friends and colleagues. Well, the only way to keep free speech is to use it. We have to, in all seriousness, speak our mind on what we sincerely hold to be true, right, important. And we just must defy the intimidation. For when they try to cancel a book or a show or a product or a person, rush out and buy it and support that person and show your support in every way you can. Even better, if you're an employer or a boss, do what Red Bull in America has done and cancel the cancellers. You've just got to just keep going. You've just got to have faith that eventually this crazy situation will change. And I think this will pass eventually, but it's going to take a few years and a few people to really stand up to it. And I think we just have to make sure that perfectly reasonable, indeed mainstream majority views, 
are not anathematized to the point that people feel that they cannot ever voice them other than secretly every few years at the ballot box when they give all the woe karate a nasty surprise. If we were genuinely wanting a better wor world and wanting to be kind to each other and wanting to be more decent, we would assume the best. When someone slips up, when they make a joke, give them a chance to apologize or clarify what they meant instead of trying to destroy their life and their family. That's disgusting behavior. I think everyone needs to really, really take a step back and see the humanity in one another. Cancel culture is a phenomenon with a long, dark history. It's destroying careers, tearing apart families, sullying our history, and undermining the very ideals our society is built upon. This un-Australian scourge can be beaten. We can and we must fight back. But hey, that's just my opinion. You're free to disagree all you like.